Two balls and a strike to count on Taylor. Reyes fires. Swing and a drive. Deep left field. This is way back. Walk the ball. What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads Live, presented by DodgerBlue.com. Happy Thursday to you. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined today by Daniel Starkin, because, Daniel, we woke up not necessarily expecting today to be a monumental day in Dodgers baseball, but a pretty significant trade takes place this morning. Originally, the reports were that Yency Almonte was going to be sent to Chicago. Then it quickly evolved to, say, Michael Bush, top 100, top 50 prospect, is also going to be included the names coming back now uh, made known to us as well. Left-hander Jackson Ferris, outfielder Zaire Hope, coming back from the, the Cubs. Um, give me just we'll, – we'll dive into who those two prospects are. I think the storyline here is that Michael Bush is no longer a Dodger. I'd love to hear your immediate thoughts. Yeah, well, first of all, it's, it's not something that's terribly surprising here. Like, I think we all – we've been saying it all along. You either play Michael Bush or you trade him. Yeah. Um, we know – Obviously, now we could kind of confirm that the Dodgers weren't super high on him. They didn't exactly want to just give him an everyday job at the major league level, uh, kind of like they did with Miguel Vargas a year ago and just give him that runway. Um, so, so it wasn't a surprising trade. I think when it came out, we first we saw Yancy Almonte was being traded, um, and then we saw that Bush was added to it. And I think just with everything that's gone off, gone on this offseason, it was like, all right, like what star are we yeah. getting back here? Like who's coming? Obviously, the first we didn't know the return at first, so you go and look at the Cubs roster, and you're like, who do they got for us? Um, and when I was looking at the roster, I was like, there's honestly not a whole lot here. Like, they have yeah. a couple solid relievers that I would have been interested in, um, but nothing really on the starting pitching side, which if the Dodgers are going to add, it, it probably would be there. Um, so then when the actual package came out, it started to make a little more sense. Um Obviously, the Dodgers are a win now team, and yeah. and we know they should be wait, making win now moves. But we've seen them make similar moves to this in the in the past, where it's a guy who has a lot of talent, is, is a really highly regarded prospect, but there's just not really much room for him in this organization. So you trade him um, and, and recoup some some prospect capital for him. Uh, we're probably not going to see you know uh, the benefits of this trade for a few years down the road, but from all accounts. They got a couple solid prospects, and and knowing the Dodgers, these guys will probably develop into top prospects in in the next couple of years. And we'll be talking about how um, it was another fleece job by Andrew Friedman. But um, overall, I, I I think it's an interesting trade, and and yeah. we'll see down the line, you know, how it goes. No, I, I think it's uh, again we will get to the two prospects and kind of what we know. And Daniel and I are going to be leaning on. We'll, we're going to sort of pull together some of the experts and give you their thoughts because you don't want my thoughts on a 19 year old that was drafted two years ago. Um, but I think Bush is is the storyline. Yancy Almonte, you know, on one hand, it's sort of I, I've got a friend who's friends with a family member of his, so that one hurt me because Yancy was a guy I felt a personal connection to. But as I was talking to a friend of mine today. If you had asked me to say who are the top five guys likely to be moved to order to make room on the 40-man roster, Yancey wouldn't have been in the top three, but he would have been in the top five simply because he had no options left. And if they were going to keep him around, he needed to stay at the major league level. It, it limited their flexibility, their ability to pull up and down like that number six starter as we expect them to do. And so while I still think Yancey Almonte is a good pitcher, and while I think $1.9 million, what he had agreed to make this year, was a good deal – I think just practically 40-man roster perspective, <clears throat> I wasn't shocked to see his name mentioned. And then Bush, to your point, we all knew to some degree that Michael Bush was probably getting traded at some point. I think that those odds skyrocketed when Teoscar Hernandez was signed because Michael Bush's best chance of sticking around was learning left field, and that got taken off the table. But I think what most Dodger fans, and I see some people live in the chat, we appreciate those on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter joining us, what, what most people I think are going to be surprised by is that the Dodgers didn't include Michael Bush in a Dylan Cease type trade. They didn't get a guy who's currently on the roster and going to help them. Instead, they literally traded him for a pair of teen teenagers. I think one of the guys turns 20 in the next couple of weeks. But that's, I think, the surprising part. And it makes me wonder, Daniel, does this tell you that the market on Michael Bush, what they could get from him, that this was it, that the Dodgers were kind of up against the timeline, that new teams, teams knew the Dodgers were desperate to move him, and so while maybe they hoped to, to package him in a Dylan Cease type trade, that maybe they realized their best option was get a couple high ranking prospects in exchange 
and then kind of kick the can down the road for when you might be able to move those guys for a major league level player. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. Like, I would imagine that Andrew Friedman had a lot of conversations with a lot of different teams surrounding Michael Bush over the last, you know, few weeks. Um, obviously, I'm guessing they would have preferred to to include him in a deal for immediate Major League help, just knowing that they're in win-now mode and such. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like, we're looking at a guy who could really hit, but he doesn't really have a defensive position, and he's 26 years old. Um he doesn't have a ton of major league experience. Like they gave him a few at bats last year. Didn't exactly go well, but tiny sample size, obviously. But, but yeah, I mean, that definitely could have been the case. Like, I don't know if um, there were, you know, like, like the white Sox we we've been talking about Dylan Cease here. I don't know. They might not have been interested in Michael Bush. So um, if you couldn't get those win now pieces, you might as well flip him and, and get younger prospects who a are not on the 40 man roster, which we know is important with the Dodgers right now. They have to open up 40 man roster spots. Obviously they still have, they haven't announced the, the Tay Oscar signing yet. There might be more moves to come. Um, it's kind of similar to um, Almonte with being able to send guys up and down. They also like having um, flexibility with the 40 man roster overall. Um, yeah. So if you trade him and get younger prospects who are not on the 40 man roster, who you could either keep and develop, for, you know, to be uh, future Dodgers, or you could you could turn and flip them in a, in a trade for Dylan Cease. Maybe the White Sox like this, like like these guys better or something. Or you could trade your other prospects, knowing we just got some other a couple yeah. you know, teenagers who 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 we were really high on. So I I think it was kind of all of the above when it, when it came to that. Um, I would guess that the Dodgers <laughs> offered Michael Bush to I don't want to say twenty nine other teams, but I would imagine a lot of conversations went on and. Yeah they felt that this was their best option out there. Yeah. Let's get into what they, they ended up getting in, in exchange for Bush and Almonte. And, and, you know, let's, let's point out Almonte when the Dodgers signed him for 1.9 million and, and avoided arbitration, they knew they could move him and, and dumping Almonte wasn't like dumping him at, he was going to be a valuable piece. Like you were getting something back for Yancy Almonte, which I think is worth pointing out, but the two guys they get back Jackson Ferris, is the headliner. This is what Jeff Passan said. Uh, it pained the Cubs to move him. He has a dream toolkit, 6'4", 200 pounds, left-handed, fastball mid-90s, change in curve as well. He has a good chance to be the best player in the deal. Zaire Hope signed a well-over slot bonus as an 11th round pick last year, impressed evaluators in his short Arizona Rookie League stint. He's a long way off, but the Dodgers have excelled more than any team at taking raw talent and molding it into something big league worthy. Big league worthy. I went back to the 2022 draft, which is when Ferris was drafted. Because the thing about Major League Baseball, that when you see what round a guy is picked in, that doesn't tell you the whole story. The, the more important number to look at is how much did it cost to sign them. Ferris, again, listed, I think second or third round is where he, second round is where he ends up getting picked. He had the 24th biggest signing bonus of any player in the 2022 draft out of high school. So that tells you something. Likewise, when you look at Hope, who was drafted in 2023, he made more money than the Dodgers fifth round pick did in signing bonus. So he was, he would have been the Dodgers sixth highest paid bonus last year because he got an overslot deal. The Cubs pulled him away from a commitment to the university of North Carolina. And so I think just on the surface, Daniel, that's helpful information that basically in Ferris, you're getting a guy that got paid like a mid to late first round pick. And in hope you're getting a guy who got paid like a fifth round draft pick and when it's two high school kids, that's significant. One other note, I found this interesting. This was from Joe Doyle, who's a minor league baseball guy. He said this, be interested to see if the Dodgers consider transitioning hope to the mound. Teams were split in the draft on his future role. I know at least one scouting director who had a third round grade on the arm. Really athletic kid who oozes projection on a number of fronts. River Ryan, same story. The Dodgers flip him. He's going to be a top prospect. So I threw a lot out there, Daniel, but A, I trust Friedman as a default and B, the more I dig into what these guys got paid and kind of the industry buzz on them as prospects, it's hard not to be pretty pleased with what the Dodgers ended up getting back. Yeah. Well, for, first of all, before I get to that, I see our, our guy Scotty in the comments here. It's his birthday today. So every, everyone wish Scott a happy birthday if you can. Um, I know it's not exactly a blockbuster deal here, but at least I'm, I'm glad Scotty got a little action on his birthday here um, as far as, you know. Uh, player movement and such but uh but yeah I, I think you laid it out very well I think the Dodgers um 
saw high upside in both these guys, even though they're yeah. really young. I think that's kind of what it is. They're trading a guy in Michael Bush who has a high floor, but at the end of the day, he's 26 years old, so the ceiling isn't necessarily super high at this point, and they're getting two teenagers who, um, like you said, were very highly touted, you know, coming out of high school. Um, I think um, the, the the fairest kid uh, could end up being a top five arm in the system, like right, like right now, without even, you know, stepping foot on the field. That's not even mentioning, like, yeah. Him getting with the Dodgers, you know, player development guys, you know, and and seeing what he could, you know, maybe become a year from now. Um, and, and then the, the other guy, like you mentioned, he he has uh, he could potentially be a guy that the Dodgers saw, uh, you know, pitching ability. And even if he was drafted as a pitching player, you mentioned River Ryan. Um, the Dodgers have a really good eye for, for, for guys like that. They see the talent. They see an arm that they feel like they could mold into being a big league pitcher. And yeah. it's going to take time like these guys are are still in their teenage years. So we, we might, it may, may be three or four years before they're big league ready. Um, but at the end of the day, if you could, you know, take high upside type guys and put them in the Dodgers system, you know, perhaps the best system in, in the major leagues as far as developing pitching goes, um, they feel that they could turn these guys in, in, into high, you know, super highly touted prospects. So um, li li like you said, I think we've learned to trust Andrew Friedman when it comes to this like me and you we're not going to sit here and pretend like we've been following these guys for years and we know exactly what the Dodgers are getting and say it's a great move or it's a horrible move or whatever we've yeah. just learned to trust Andrew Friedman and the Dodgers front office when it comes to this stuff we've seen it time and time again they flip Matt Beatty for River Ryan they flip Mitch White for um you know Nick Frasso and and so on and so on so um I'm excited to see what these guys could do um, when you get them with the Dodgers pitching guys for for a year or two, um, obviously there's a lot of upside there. So I, I think it's a, it's a wait and see type of move, but it, but it could potentially pay big dividends down the road. One other person I just want to quote here, um, Greg Huss, who is out of the vines on Twitter. He follows Cubs prospects, and our guy Justin Lorber retweeted him, which is why I'm comfortable citing him as somebody that that might be worth listening to. He said, "I have Jackson Ferris ranked eighth in the Cubs system." and have been by far the most aggressive with my ranking of hope at 13th. The Cubs acquired a top 50 prospect in Michael Bush and filled the position of need at the MLB level, but gave up two future top 50 guys in the process. He's not saying they're guaranteed, but he's saying that's the type of potential. These are two guys that as 19-ish year old players could be top 50 prospects in all of Major League Baseball by the time this is all said and done, which is why Jeff Passan, I believe, is the one that's saying Ferris could end up being the best player in this deal. I see people in the comments comment noting that Bush was an overage prospect. So when you when you factor all those things in, the Dodgers got a couple prospects that aren't taking up 40 man roster spots who could be moved in a deal for a Dylan Cease or Corbin Burns at the deadline or whoever it is. But at the very least, in the meantime, these guys, you would expect Daniel to be better prospects a year from now in the Dodgers system with some Dodger tweaks because that's just what the Dodgers do. I think that's kind of my like default. I see people on Twitter tweeting at us saying, Hey, who won the trade? You know? And it's like, I will just default to Andrew Friedman is smarter than me, but he also happens to be smarter than 95% of the other people in baseball who do the same job that he does. These are the trades that end up pre presenting us with river Ryan presenting us with Nick Frasso. Like, that's where these players come from. You know, Jeter Downs, who has ended up being flipped for Mookie Betts, came in these types of trades. And so the Dodgers just have a history of getting the best player in these trades, even if it means ultimately developing them and then flipping them down the road. And so I guess I would end, Daniel, and I would sort of land the plane here before we take a couple questions from folks in the chat with, I trust Andrew Friedman. Not only does the industry seem to like these two players, not that the Dodgers won, by the way, like, it's just the Dodgers traded a guy in Bush that they had no place for and a guy in Almonte who had no options. So the Cubs might end up with really good players in this deal, but the Dodgers traded out really good players they didn't have a use for for a couple guys that that people like. Yeah, yeah. I don't see why this can't be a deal that works out well, you know, for both teams yeah. based on what their needs are. Like, like in reality, the Dodgers just didn't have a spot for Michael Bush on the major league roster, especially after they just added to Oscar Hernandez. Whereas the Cubs need bats right away and they have an opening at third base. So Michael Bush might go over there and get a chance to earn that everyday third base job. And and they might have some openings in their bullpen where Yancy like Yancy Almonte is going to be on the roster and might have a really good year. 
and, and the Dodgers have more prospects to either develop or or to trade from when the deadline comes around or next offseason or whatever. So I, I definitely think um, this could be a deal that works out for both sides. I'm I'm happy for Michael Bush first and yeah. foremost. I'd say like that kid deserves a chance to be able to play like he's done everything he could at the triple a level and i think the dodgers recognize that which is why um you know they were so set on getting a deal done here so so yeah i definitely think um it's it's wait and see from from both sides i guess but i i think it could end up working out well for both sides um we are going to take some questions here if you'd like to submit a question we've got a few more minutes put all caps questions at the front that helps us find those one more tweet that was just sent to me this is from jim callis who's an mlb draft guy he said, glad to see Bush get a clear shot at playing time with the Cubs. He will hit. Intrigued to see how Ferris continues to develop with the Dodgers. Might be the game's top left-handed pitching prospect in the future. Hope is an intriguing MLB draft sleeper. So, look, if the Dodgers get a guy that is even close to becoming the top left-handed pitching prospect in all of Major League Baseball, as Jim Callis, a guy who would know, says, then... That's a pretty uh, a pretty positive outcome, I would say, for the Dodgers. Again, acknowledging that everybody in the world knew that they were going to try and move Michael Bush and also acknowledging the Dodgers, to sign Teoscar Hernandez, needed to open a 40-man roster spot and knowing that there's another move coming, whether it's a Ryan Brazier type or something bigger, it wasn't like they just needed one 40-man spot. So I, I would say, in the end, um, pretty positive stuff here. Um, first question here from Kevin. Do you think the Dodgers have another trade in the works? This was one of my thoughts, Daniel. Is it possible that they're acquiring these players to then maybe turn around and package for Dylan Cease or somebody like that? Um, the more I read, the more I'd like these prospects, which makes me think maybe the Dodgers just want to keep them. But what mm -hmm. do you think? Uh, I wouldn't rule anything out at this point. Like the Dodgers still have the flexibility to go out and pretty much do whatever they want. Um, and now they have an open 40-man roster spot, too. Like, I think Teoscar will take Bush's spot, yeah. and then they have an open spot um, for, for Yancy Almonte. So maybe maybe there's a trade in the works. Maybe they're trading some of their other pitching prospects, So and then these guys can kind of take their spot in the organization. Or maybe, you know, there's a free agent signing out there. Like, maybe if they wanted to sign a Josh Hader who has a quali qualifying offer attached to him, they, they would lose, uh, you know, draft picks if they signed him. Maybe they they say, hey, we just got these nineteen year old prospects. We're fine giving up those draft draft picks now. Um, they've been linked to Ryan Brazier. Maybe maybe they look to re-sign him now. So I definitely think um, anything is possible at this point. Related, Roy wants to know what's the next move now that there is an open forty man roster spot. I had been saying all along that I didn't think they necessarily needed to go out and make a bullpen move, and part of that was because hey, they just gave Almonte. 2 million bucks, which yeah. given the arbitration situation is not nothing, but he had no options. So it was like he needed to be in the major league bullpen in order for him to be on the roster. That's no longer the case. I still don't necessarily think it's like the biggest, most massive need in the history of the world, but you mentioned Ryan Brazier. I could definitely see a Ryan Brazier. Maybe even you mentioned I, Josh Hader to me. I still can't wrap my head around how that fits with how Friedman tends to do business, but do you think a relief pitcher is now going to be a move the Dodgers make in order to make up for the loss of El Monte? To, to be honest, I, I still think starting pitcher is more of a need. Like, I still think the bullpen's in, in a pretty good spot right now um, with a lot of, you know, the guys they have coming back from injury and such. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think they'll probably look to add one more reliever. Like, that might – it might not be a big money type guy. It might be a, a – someone they could get for relatively cheap that they see, you know, upside in, like similar to like a Shelby Miller last season. Like there's still a ton of arms out there. Um, and I, I'm with you. I like, I still don't think Hater is, is likely by any means, but you never know if his market, like if his market isn't what he thought it was and he wants, you know, maybe a, a high money one or two year deal as opposed to the four or five year deal he was looking for, then may, maybe uh, the Dodgers jump in there. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'd say um, for me personally, I would rather add a starter. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if they go the reliever route instead. So Derek throws a hypothetical that I think you just answered, but he said, if you could only have one of Hater or Cease and they cost the same, which that's the tricky part, you'd have to trade for Cease or sign Hater. But yeah. if if you could choose between one or the other, would you take Cease? Um, yeah, yeah, I would take Cease. I, I still think if you could add another top of the rotation type starting pitcher, um, that would make this team more better than if you're adding a closer. 
Yeah, I'm with you. I would take Cease. Uh, two years of team control. I believe he just his arbitration number this year was eight million dollars. Um, I know he was it was a down year last year, but given all the smoke around the Dodgers possibly going to a six man rotation, um, I think adding a guy that in Cease, by the way, who's made like a hundred starts in three years, so he doesn't miss starts. Um, I think that would be uh, an absolutely valuable thing there. So that would be my answer. Um, that um and of course some people in the chat also mentioning clayton kershaw if he were to ever sign would be a, a 40-man roster addition that they would need to make as well i kind of wonder if it once kershaw makes his decision if because of the timeline and because of the trust that he would have with either the dodgers or the rangers to be frank if he kind of does it in a way that's team friendly from the perspective of once the 60-day il becomes a thing then that's when a kershaw signing were to become official so that yes you would need a 40-man roster spot to add him but then you could immediately move him to the 60-day il I i'm just guessing there but um it's just an option so um again the headline today if you're just joining us before we log off here the dodgers send michael bush and yancy almonte to the cubs for a pair of prospects uh ferris and hope again both of these guys upside oozing with potential some of the language there they're teenagers they're kids that are one or two years out of high school but so far it seems like the returns have been positive and these are guys that were paid you know like i said ferris was signed as if he was like the 24th best player in the draft and hope was signed as if he was a fourth or fifth round pick when you factor in that they're high school players and the variance as far as possible success it's hard not to at least you know maybe you're not excited about losing bush and losing almonte but it's not a nothing returner. It's better than reading like, Hey, these guys stink. I don't know what the Dodgers see in them. So again, thanks everybody for hopping on for a live show here on a Thursday afternoon with us. You can check out more content like this on our YouTube page, subscribe and ring the notification bell. Whenever there's a move, we jump right on and are able to discuss it. We've got live shows every Sunday night, post game shows. Once the season, we'd love to have you. And if you're a podcast person, potentially listening to us via podcast right now. Thank you. Apple, Spotify, and Google search for Dodger heads. That is Daniel Starkin. I am Jeff Spiegel. Enjoy the rest of your day, folks. And as always, go Dodgers.